Everybody see it? Yes, we're all good to go. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this is a, a, a glimpse into bio-inspired robotics, kind of an overview of where what the idea is and um, some of the cool stuff that's come from it. Um, so let's begin. Oops. There you go. Okay, so just briefly, I wanna talk about uh, what bio-inspired robotics is, kind of just give a ground level definition of that so that we can move forward from there um, to talk about how we do bio-inspired robotics. Um, but I also wanna talk about nature itself, that there are some things in nature that make us want to do uh, the robotics that we do. And then how do we do it? How do we look at nature and extract information and replicate it or, or mimic it? Um, and then I'm gonna give you some examples and I'm, I'm gonna talk of course about RoboRaven at the end. I'm gonna leave some space for that so that we can uh, delve into that awesome project. So just briefly, bio-inspired robotics is any kind of robotics that has been designed or developed um, through the observation of nature and taking the information from nature, observing how nature works, observing the mechanisms of nature, the patterns of nature, the behaviors of natural forms and using that to improve the technology. And it's amazing how how much that can be used to improve the technology because it's not just building actual platforms that look like animals kind of like this is this is a picture of Robo Raven down here. Um, this is also down here. You have a picture of Spot. This is Boston Dynamics, awesome uh, walking robot that I've seen in person. And let me tell you, it freaks me out. I'm thinking uh, Terminator with this thing, but nonetheless, it's amazing. Um, the point is that it doesn't just have to be actual robotic platforms. It can be the computer code, how the computer thinks. It could be the sensors that are created. There are some sensors that people are, are mimicking like fish eyes or how uh, animals adapt color changes to temperature changes or you know stuff like that. Um, it could be how a robot that isn't necessarily bio-inspired, some stock robot like a, 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 a UAV or an underwater robot can have their behavior adapted to mimic um, the natural world. And then very important is materials. There is a lot of inspiration on uh, the natural materials, how natural materials work um, that has been used in robotics. So let's move on from, from there. So there are four things that we look at in nature uh, to use for robotic platforms patterns, forms, functions, and behaviors. So just a brief overview, patterns are things like structures, like honeycombs, um, the way that bees make honeycombs. And you can see now NASA is even thinking about using honeycomb structures because of how stable they are. Um, communications are another pattern, the clicks and the beeps and the chirps and that dolphins use, the people are finding that uh, dolphins, it, it was actually quite amazing. There was a, a paper that came out that showed that dolphins actually choose their names uh, when they grow up and it's a series of clicks and beeps that the dolphins recognize. Um, so those are patterns as well. And then you have camouflage or how, um, the like a, a butterfly wing, how the structure is actually made, the different overlapping patterns of that. So then there's the form and the form uh, often relates to the function. It also often relates to the behavior. So uh, the form of a bird gives, um, uh, lets it fly very well and, and different birds, depending upon the type of flight that they do, it's very connected to the form of that bird. And then, you know, conversely, you have fish, the way that a fish is formed or the way that a dolphin is formed lends itself to the swimming behavior. So we look at that and, and we look at that because we wonder, is it possible that maybe nature has it right and we've been doing it wrong? Um, is it possible that the environmental adaptation has made it better uh, than the current technology, especially in form? Um, so for function, we're talking about how does something 
do what it does? How does a muscle contract so that my hands are moving? How do neurons move in our brain so that my brain is thinking and I'm talking to you right now? How do plants communicate through fungi, communicate to clouds, make the rain, all of that stuff? How does that happen? And is it possible to improve the technology by looking at that? And then there are behaviors. This is how um, this is how anything interacts with the environment. How does it relate to other creatures? Is there is there something called symbiosis or is it parasitic? How do they raise their young? How do they understand their environment? You know, we do believe that animals, and I don't know about plants, but they have this weird chemical communication. But the point is that do they understand? their environment, do they recognize? I mean, we know that animals uh, recognize territory. We know that they say, this is my territory, especially if it's a predatory, isolated predatory animal. This is my territory. This is your territory. Don't come into my territory. You know, they that is an understanding of their environment. It's al almost a creative imprintation. If you wanna be, you know, with the eye of faith, say that, <laughs> that it's a creative imprintation um, on their environment, that they're making their environment, they're understanding it and they're making it. So is it possible to use this in robotics, possibly in how robotics think, how they behave? Um, so that's kind of what we look at in nature and, and we kind of uh, uh, use that to inform our behavior. So it's just some examples of this. Um, over here, this is, this is amazing to me, swarming behavior. It's very popular. I think, I think, I don't know if anyone saw the Super Bowl, I'm gonna name drop here. I don't know if anyone saw the Super Bowl with Lady Gaga five years ago where she took all of the drones and she had the you know American flag come out. Okay, so that, that was someone looking at the swarming behavior of, animals of, of natural forms and seeing that these swarms create shapes. Why they create shapes, we don't know. We know that input can, can change them. Is it that the animals are trying to make themselves bigger as a group to make themselves more uh, um, dangerous to predators? We don't know. Point is, it gets stuff done. And <laughs> so now we can apply this to nature and I mean to our robotics. And we, the robotics are able to, as a group, get amazing things done. So there's also something like at the, at the very micro scale, the way the DNA folds and unfolds, there are people who are working on origami robots that can fold themselves into shape based on different materials, kind of mimicking that. Um, butterfly wings. I love butterflies. Uh, this, is, this is our monarch from... Maryland. I can't really say from Maryland because it's everywhere on the Eastern shore and Mexico, but hey, it's here. Um, but you know, if you look at a bird's wings, not only can they repel water because of how the material of the wing is, but there's this translucent ability to attract, reflect light situation going on there. So there are people who are looking at that um, as a potential for sensors or as a potential for creating new materials that can repel water that are incredibly lightweight. And then, you know, my favorite animal locomotion, um, there's this guy running across the water. Basically, the adaptation for the environment to be able to move in the environment um, is incredible. And lending itself to, to robotic platforms, is it possible that just having a treaded wheel it's not the best way of moving in the environment. Maybe something that's more um, animal-like would be better. So that's what I'm talking about when I say natural inspirations, just some examples. There are so many out there. I mean, you, quite frankly, I, in, in my description, I, I said it, you walk outside your door and you're bombarded with miracles every day, basically. We, we ignore them because we have to get to work. But the point is that, you know, the, the trees, uh, will 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 come back in this in the spring. That's amazing. You know, um, the funga the fungi and the flora on the ground replicating themselves constantly every day. The way that our cells die and re, you know constantly replicate. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. So there's so many other inspirations in nature for this. So um, why do we? This this is a big question that I, I get asked, and and honestly, it's a valid question. Why do we even bother looking at nature? I think I've said it before that there are some advantages that natural forms have that robotic platforms and and human technology in general general just does not have. So 
I've narrowed it to three. You can add more, but the way that I look at it, there are three main advantages. One is that all biological forms have adapted to their environment. Their form, their function, their behavior, it's all adapted to their environment. To wit, if you remove a, a creature from one environment and put it in a zoo, you have to manufacture as close to that environment as you possibly can to get the creature to act as it normally would. It just speaks to how connected you know, the environment and the, the creature is. The second is energy efficiency. I cannot stress enough how amazing it is that we are, that, that birds and that animals and that cells are able to do all of these processes multiple times a second um, on the fuel that they eat, just, just the food that they eat. There's, a, there's the ability of the natural form to take fuel in such an efficient way um, and turn it into usable energy. And that's a big advantage from robotics. And the second thing, which may sound ubiquitous, but is absolutely true, is that nature is alive. <laughs> I know it's obvious, but it's true. That's a huge advantage that it's alive. Um, so just to, to, to give more of an understanding on those three things, when you're adaptation driven and you're tailored to the environment, you move better, you think better. It's, it's all based on um, moving in that environment and operating in that environment. But most of human innovation is physics driven, not adaptation driven. And by physics, physics driven, I mean that, you know, there are no jet engines in nature. I will contend that jet engines are probably better and faster than, you know, if you had a bird flying. But there are no jet engines in nature. It's based on an understanding of the laws of thermodynamics. Our cars are based on the understanding of internal combustion. These things are based on physical laws, not necessarily natural laws. And so is there a disadvantage at you know, ignoring the natural law when, when um, basing everything on physical law? And the second bullet point here is it goes back to the fact that nature is alive. It can heal, it can replicate, it can sense, think, communicate, refuel, move, protect itself, all of this stuff seamlessly without any input. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if you could drop a robot, which I have done, and it fixed itself? Yeah, that doesn't happen. Nature does that. You break your ankle and it heals itself. You drop a robot out of the sky, you cry a thousand tears as you drag it back to your lab and hope that the millions of dollars you spent on it are not wasted when you fix it. We have to input it ourselves. So that's a huge advantage that nature has. And then uh, nature is driven by chemical and cellular energy, which is a high power density. The amount of chemical energy that it takes just for me to do this. You know, if I were to replicate that, I would need serious voltage in an actual power cell to, to make a hand do this. Um, a big example of this, by the way, is a hummingbird. Hummingbirds, I know, they eat, I don't know how many hundreds of times a day, they're like constantly refueling. But the point is that the, the speed at which they, they flip back and forth like that is huge energy density. There are people who have tried to replicate that in UAVs to make small, you know, hummingbird sized UAVs. And the amount of voltage that's required is insane. It's tethered to this big power system that you can't move. So it can't really fly outside. It's just really proof of concept. Can we even do this? And no, no one's really gotten to very tiny size that can just you know fly around. Not that I know of. I don't know what the military is doing. I, I just preface that, uh, but whatever they're doing. The normal people, <laughs> I don't know if we have gotten stuff like that. You know, so it's these are these are serious advantages, and this is why we look at nature and try to replicate it with with bio inspired robotics. Um, so how do we do this now? Um, humans have been looking at the natural world for millennia for inspiration. We know this. I believe it was, there was a question at the beginning of the lecture. Is there anything else that is uh, inspired by nature? And, and simply, it's because we've been living in it for tens of thousands of however many thousands of years, and it, it's around us. So we just, we think and we get inspiration for it. Big example of this is Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of a flying machine. He looked at the flapping behavior of birds and said, let me try to replicate that. Um, unfortunately for him, large scale causes vibrations. So it didn't 
quite work as planned, um, but still inspiration. Um, so how do we extract this information from, from nature? Um, so the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to mimic the nature? Or are we going to be inspired by it? There's a big difference. Mimicry is almost a one-to-one -one connection. So if I was to create a robotic hand, it would look like this, basically. Um, as opposed to inspiration is more broad. So let's say instead of creating a robotic hand, I just wanted to be inspired by how my palm does this. And so I create a material that can do that. And I apply it to a different system. I'm inspired by it. I'm not trying to directly mimic it. Right. So that's a big question we have to ask. And sometimes there are advantages for one or the other because mimicry is sometimes necessary depending upon the application, but it can also be very complicated. And nature, I don't want to say lies to us, but it kind of does. It makes it seem as though, you know, it's simple. You, you dissect a frog and it's so simple. It, look, it only has nine organs or whatever, but it's not that simple. It's very complicated to try to replicate that in, in the lab, you know? So is it worth it? Or do you just want something that already is an established technology and you adapt it using something that is inspired by nature. The second question is, uh, do we go outside and stare at the sky for hours and ins get inspired by the design? Or do we recognize that there is a fault in the current technology and we then go to nature to be inspired by it? Both is the case. Sometimes, you know, it's good to just, as a, as a bio-inspired, someone who likes to do bio-inspired engineering, to just go outside and I don't know, watch the squirrels all day, look at fungus, just, just to be inspired and see these things. But very often it's more the reverse. We recognize that there's an application that we wanna do with our current technology and the current technology is limited. And so then we say, well, you know, we want something to swim. It doesn't swim very well or it doesn't swim very silently, but hey, look, there's a fish that's doing that. So then we go and we try to understand the mechanism behind, you know, how it does that and try to um, use that to inspire our robotic platforms. So it's, it's both. It can be either, but it's usually that, you know, necess necessity is the mother of invention. And then we go out and we, we look in nature for what what's out there. So then the next thing is we understand the mechanism and then we are inspired. This is actually one of the hardest parts of bio-inspired robotics because understanding the mechanism of how something happens. You can, you can look at nature and, and biologists do a very good job of this. They look at nature, they understand nature. They say, this is the behavior. This is what we see. Th these are the findings, but how? How is it that when a bird flies, it's able to push the air down? What is the mechanism? Where are the muscles? Is it because of just because the bones are porous or we, is it because of the feathers? Is it because of the airfoil? Is it because of the sweeping action? Like how? <laughs> Seriously, this is like the, the biggest stuff. And so then how do we take that mechanism and, and replicate it? Is it even possible to do that, you know? And so that's the second, the, the, the fourth question, is it possible with the current technology to even replicate this at all? I tell you, there are so many people who would love to make, you know, a jellyfish robot or a stingray robot or a robot that walks like a human being. Is the technology there? Maybe, you know, at that point, you know, you basically say, uh, maybe we have to improve the technology to catch up to nature at that point. And then it's, you know, do we have the materials to, for it? Do we have the, the batteries for it? Do we even understand how this works so that we can do this seamlessly? It, nature is amazing. It really is. And, and so trying to replicate that can, can be very difficult. Um, but nonetheless, there are some people who have uh, done very a very good job of um, replicating certain aspects of the natural world in 
robotics. So here are some examples. Um, the first over here is, if you ever wanna be inspired by bio-inspired robotics, go to Festo. Festo is an amazing company in Europe somewhere. I think they're in the Netherlands. Um, but basically they invented, well not invented, but they're, they're very good at pneumatic actuation. And so they basically uh, went from there to, hey, let's do, every, let's do these bio-inspired things that they've created elephant trunks to help you with uh, grasping crazy objects at weird angles. And they've made gigantic blimps that are stingrays that kind of just float around the, the office while they're eating lunch. And then they had a, you know, a kangaroo because they were trying to replicate jumping behavior. Um, and they have, they have a human hand. So they have so many things, basically. Uh, I just wanted to pick one thing that was amazing. And, and this is one of them. This is the Festo butterfly. Um, it's not quite butterfly size. It's more blue jay size. Um, getting things to a very small size is incredibly difficult. And there's an entire engineering called um, miniature robotics or, or micro engineering that is based on that. And it's simply because when you get to small sizes, there are certain forces of nature that don't matter at big sizes that absolutely matter at small sizes. Um, for instance, the whole concept of taking a submarine that's really big and shrinking it down and putting it in your body, not gonna happen because the forces at that size are going to push against the propeller and it'll just spin forever and ever and ever. It won't go anywhere. So why is it that an ant can lift, you know, ridiculous amounts times its body weight? Because it's tiny. If it was big, you know, it would basically collapse in on itself and, and, and kill us all. So <laughs> small size, very difficult. But the point is that Festo was able to create a, a, um, a robotic butterfly that does fly like a butterfly. It has the same mechanism and it it's kind of flapping wing, it has a little bit of a motor right here um, and its wings are flexible. And that's one of the biggest innovations is that the wings are flexible. Flexible materials and flexible wings are something that you see in nature all the time but you do not see in robotic platforms. You know, I've seen slugs in my yard that can go from being, you know, this big to curling up and being like this big with, with no damage to themselves. No, no, we can't do that, okay, <laughs> in robotics. Try taking a, a piece of metal, and it's because they're, they're made of metal, a, a metal robot and trying to crunch it to that size, it just doesn't work. So flexible materials are really important and also very bio-inspired. Um, then you have, you know, the big guy, Boston Dynamics Spot. This guy made quite a splash when he uh, landed in the robotic world. He's quadruped, he's four legs, um, and is pretty much able to go over almost every terrain like an animal, but what makes him special, what is so special about this guy is his internal processing. So if you remember when I said that, you know, bio-inspiration doesn't just have to be the platform, it can also be the uh, computer code. So the way that this guy thinks, the way that he senses is that he recognizes his center of gravity and he is able to self-correct constantly like we do when we're walking and we we recognize that we're off or we're flipping and you know he can flip himself back and so it makes him incredibly stable um if you've ever seen i've seen spot in person um you know there's a test where you kind of push him you kind of like hit him like this if you do that with any other robot it'll flip over because it doesn't have that capability. But this guy, it'll push back at you. It'll actually self-write as if you're pushing a friend and that friend is pushing back at you. It's, it's so amazing. Um, so, and I think they're working on a new one that's even more um, Terminator-esque. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. So another uh, example is RoboCrab. RoboCrab actually came out of our lab a couple of years ago um, and it's based on the horseshoe crab. I had to have something here that was seen in Maryland. So horseshoe crabs. Um, the amazing thing about horseshoe crabs is that you can almost uh, think of them as a robot for an extreme environment, something that 
changes constantly because the surf is constantly coming in and out. The sand is changing, it's getting washed away. Um, it can go on rocks, it can go on sand, it can go a little bit on, on grass. So that's actually something that we want to study when we're doing robotics because it's, it's, it's a robot that can move in different environments. Um, the difference between this robot and a horseshoe crab is that if a horseshoe crab gets flipped over on its side, we have to come and flip it back over. This guy was designed with a little internal uh, gyroscope so that if it flips over, it can use its tail, its tail right here, to flip itself back. And we thought about this, um, ironically, for Mars. I don't know where the thought process was there, how we connected it, but it makes sense. I will connect the dots. If you're on Mars right now, think about the millions and millions and billions of dollars that it takes to build a satellite and build these, these uh, amazing rovers, not speaking against them, they are awesome. But what happens if they break down? They, you know, they get flipped over, they get stuck in a rut. That's millions of dollars, billions of light years away. <laughs> you know? So what if you had something that was walking on Mars, can walk on the sand of Mars, and then it flips over and then it realizes it flips over, so it flips itself back. That was kind of the concept of that. Um, but it just shows you that, you know, the, the use of bio-inspired robotics is, is everywhere. It can be used in, in pretty much any application. Um, finally, this is a robotic hand that I made when I was a master's student. It's made of soft materials, um, except, for the, except for the hard shell here that's 3D printed. Um, it was a very simple idea. It's not as, it's not as you know, complex as something that you, know, you see on TV, uh, but the, the idea here was that you can create something really quickly and uh, cheaply. And um, looking, at, looking at nature and looking at the materials, I chose a silicone because you know, silicones are soft and they're very highly compliant. And so you don't need all of the, the joints and the actuators and everything that makes those really expensive hands work. You can just get, you know, a, a silicone finger, mold it, make it pneumatic, inflate it, and you get the same, you know, you get the same curve. So um, it was a proof of concept. It did kind of work. I got it to play the piano, as you can see. That was pretty amazing. Um, so the biz biggest example of bio-inspired robots, why am I here? Uh, <laughs> because of RoboRaven. Um, RoboRaven is, um, I, I would say it's it's quite a mimicry as well as an inspiration, and I will talk about uh, that why uh, later. Um, Robo Raven is about a 14 year old project. I think it started um, the 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 beginnings of it started before 2010, and um, we've been adding to it over the years, basically because it takes a lot to add to this platform. But it's a flapping wing UAV which is to say that it generates its lift and its thrust and its turning power by flapping. So this is inspired by the way that birds fly. And the reason for that is because, you know, if you look at the current unmanned aerial technology, they kind of fall into two categories. You have the fixed wing that kind of looks like a plane and you have the quad rotor helicopter looking one. Now, the, the one that looks like a plane is very efficient in its flight, but it's not as maneuverable. You know, it can do dives and stuff like that, but it cannot turn on a dime. Um, quad rotors, on the other hand, very maneuverable, can definitely turn on a dime, but drains the battery with every single motor that you have. You need a bigger battery. You need a higher amount of energy. If you look at birds, they are maneuverable. They are energy efficient, incredibly energy efficient when they fly. And so we wanted to see if it was possible to replicate that and, and bring that into the robotic sphere, create a platform that can do things that other UAVs could not do. And, and we picked the Raven because Ravens are incredible. They're very acrobatic. They're actually, I think, one of the few birds that can fly upside down for long distances, for, for not long distances, for like 10 seconds, they'll actually flip up, upside down and soar through the air upside down. Um, and they're also incredibly intelligent. If you, if you ever wanna laugh, go on YouTube and look at how these ravens will trick dogs and, and, and trick humans into giving them food. Um, I had a friend once who actually watched a raven uh, take a cardboard box 
after a snowstorm, take a car cardboard box, hop, hop up to the top of a roof, slide down, hop up to the top with the cardboard box. It's like, so it was literally sledding down the roof. It was incredible and hilarious, but that just shows you how intelligent ravens are. Um, so Robo Raven one, this was the one that came in around 2010, 2011. It was the first success of this. Replicating flapping flight is very difficult. There is this uh, weird kinetic interplay between the airfoil, which is the curve of the wing, as well as the uh, amount of flapping that's being done and the amount of air that's being pushed. If you get it wrong, it'll simply fall out of the sky. It is not something that's easy to replicate. So we just wanted to see if we could do it first off. And this was our first success in getting it done. Uh, so I actually have a video here. I don't know if you guys can hear the sound. Can you hear the sound? No, okay, well, that's good because I didn't want you. <laughs> that's a distraction. But the point is, um, this was a Robo Raven one, just getting it to flap and just getting it to fly untethered in the environment. And untethered is very important because there are a lot of flapping wing birds that can fly inside and with a tether to keep it going. Having something that can fly outside with no tether in the environment was big. The other thing that was cool, as you just saw there, is that it could do flips and dives and turn on a dime. It had that acrobatic ability uh, that the birds had. And the reason is because of what you just saw there. It has independent wing control, which means that we have two motors in the front and each one controls one wing and the other one. And in the computer code, it's a separate um, communication. So what that does is it allows us to control the bird just like uh, an actual bird can control one wing separate than another one. And that gave us a lot of maneuverability as well as um, flight capability. That's pretty cool. There's another dive right there. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so the other thing that was really important and was kind of the breakthrough here is kind of what he's talking about right now with the way that the front end was designed. These wings were specifically designed for Robo Raven and they were designed to be flexible. Um, interestingly enough, we did not create something that behaved like a bird in flight. We created something that behaved more like a dragonfly. <laughs> oh, that was an example of it was so, it was so, um, it, it looks so much like a bird that a bird actually attacked it. it. It thought it was a bird. And there's another example of a bird trying to kind of fly with it. Um, so that actually um, talks about some of the applications that we have for if we wanted to do um, monitoring of, of animals in situ while they're flying, um, we could actually have something that could fly in a flock and the birds wouldn't be too disturbed by it, you know, really up close pictures of, of birds. Um, but anyway, back to the wings, they were very flexible and it was a process that we had to create to make them lightweight as well so that they could fly and create the curve that is necessary to push air down so that you can get that flapping motion. Um, and, and this one was not autonomous, uh, meaning it, you know, flying by itself. We did actually get one that was autonomous and that was another weird situation. Um, where um, we had to figure out how to the, the autonomous takeoff, flight, landing, no, none of that. Uh, more like we get into the air and then we turn off our control and it you know, flaps for, by itself uh, for a little bit. And it just, again, speaks to how complicated nature is to be able to, for, for birds to be able to push off, get lift, fly, and then land, that's, that's really difficult. Um, so then the next thing that we did, which was really cool with Robo Raven, the next, the next project after that guy got his PhD and was like, I created a bird that flies. Um, we said, what can we do with this technology? So this is an example of, of stepping back from mimicry and moving more to inspiration. We wanted to improve the efficiency of the flight, um, the, the efficiency of the battery itself. And so 
I don't know if we were inspired by the Greek hero Icarus, but we basically wanted to put solar panels on this thing so that it could fly too close to the sun. But the goal was so that it could charge the battery while it was flying and get this continuous flight, something that people have been trying to do with gliders for a long time to create green energy so that they don't have to use you know, the, fu the fossil fuels to fly. Uh, we wanted to see if we could do it with a bird. Um, so yes, <laughs> it, we were able to put solar panels on the wing and it was successful in charging the battery. Was it successful in perpetual flight? Not so much. Um, as I said before, the energy density, it, it is so critical. The fact that birds can eat little seeds, fill themselves up and then fly forever. I mean, it's incredible. We just don't have the battery power to do that. We just don't. And even adding solar panels didn't help. Uh, but we were able to extend our flight further. Um, which was pretty cool. And that was actually pretty groundbreaking in, in the robotic world. The other thing that we did was, um, I don't know if you noticed, these wings are much bigger than the ones that we had before. Uh, we basically created larger wings, kind of, kind of scaled this up from a, a raven to an eagle and did that so that we could pile uh, solar panels as, as many as we could on the, the wing to get as much charging as we could. Um, so that was kind of the, the next, iteration to see if we could do that. And it was pretty much of a success, I think. I liked it. Um, so after we did that, we went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, how can we further improve the design? We still want to keep something that flaps. We still want to make it, you know, usable. But if you look at these UAV platforms that are out there, these quadcopters and stuff like that, they're so fast. And this platform was fast already. But they're, the quadcopters are so fast and the planes are able to get so high. I mean, they're able to get, you know, hundreds of feet in the air. So is it possible for us to get something that could carry a payload maybe in a disaster situation um, and make it comparable to these platforms that are de delivering kidneys to hospitals, basically? Um, so the next thing that we did was we stepped even further back from the, the mimicry, we were still inspired by, you know, nature and we kept the flapping behavior, but we wanted to add uh, more of a human touch to it. So we put propellers on the back of the platform. And this was the first mixed modal, meaning two, two methods of, um, of flight propulsion. Um, the, the first mixed modal platform that has existed, you know, for other untethered flight like we did. Um, and, and this really did take the cake. I mean, it made the platform very fast. You'll see in a second uh, that, I mean, th this little dot in the sky, it went so high in the air and it was able to, um, um, you know, be comparable to some of the other UAVs that exist out there. So the other thing that was pretty cool was that our acrobatic ability uh, improved. And so the, flips and the dips and the dives that we were able to do actually got a little bit better. Um, the weird thing was that at this point, we having moved so far from nature, we realized that what we've done is we've created a new thing. We've created something that's bio-inspired, but also is very human inspired. And so if, as you can see here, this thing is at this point, it's gliding, you know, it's diving, it's gliding. You can flap it like a bird, you can fly it like a plane, you know. It was pretty amazing that we could do both of those things at the same time. And it also had a sensor, um, it had a, um, a larger amount of sensors that could be put on the platform. So the, the payload did actually increase. And um, we were able to put, you know, GPS and stuff like that on it. So then we could do scientific studies on the platform in ways that we couldn't do with, with the other platforms. Um, the other platforms basically would fall out of the sky if you put the amount of weight on it. I should know, I tried and it was a horrible crash. Um, so <laughs> anyway, so that's that's Robo Raven. Uh, that's my project. Um, moving forward over time, I actually uh, came after Robo Raven 5. And what I did was I went back to nature. I reversed, our, I re reversed the process and I said, let's make it more energy efficient by how 
birds are energy efficient in gliding and flapping and gliding and soaring and stuff like that, because there are some people who are looking into that to improve the platform without necessarily improving the battery or improving like how the platform is made. Um, and we were able to get some decent results um, to show that it is possible to, to get this platform to flap and glide and um, how it improved the drain on the battery so that it could fly longer using these bio-inspired methods that birds use um, all the time. So I'm not sure where this is going to go in the future. We'll see. Uh, I, there are some things I'd like to see. Like I'd like to see this thing perch. I'd like to see it, you know, come and plop and then come and leave. You know, I, I'd like to see that. That would be pretty amazing. It cannot do that right now. I think it would actually hurt the tree if it tried, um, which is also a concern. Um, and then, you know, maybe doing something where, you know, birds can fly in the rain. They can fly in high winds. Um, I did not get to true soaring, true soaring where a bird catches a wind and it can go for hours and hours and hours loitering in the sky. I was not able to replicate that because that is incredibly difficult. You have to find, you know, the thermal that allows the bird to do that. And, and again, when it comes to robots, robots can't see, they can't think for themselves. So you have to create the technology uh, for the robot to see something that can be used or sense the wind changing or sense that there's a different temperature and, and then use that. Um, so there's a lot of steps to that. I'd like to see that happen. Um, I'm gonna try to speak into the ear of the next PhD student that takes on this project. Um, but yeah, that's Robo Raven. That's our awesome project. Um, so finally, I just, you know, some acknowledgements. Um, the entire Robo Raven team is, is vast. <laughs> like I said, it's like a 14 year project at University of Maryland, uh, most of whom are in the mechanical engineering department, but I believe we had someone who was aerospace, uh, just a shout out to them. Um, if you guys wanna see some more cool bio-inspired robotics, um, at the University of Maryland, there's something called the Maryland Robotics Center. It's an interdisciplinary center where different professors from different disciplines come together to make amazing robotic platforms. And one of the focus areas is, is bio-inspired robotics. So if you want to check out some other cool robots that exist, you can go on our YouTube page and go to UMD Robotics um, and click on the playlist. Uh, playlist that has uh, bio-inspired robotics. You can look at other things too that are amazing. Um, there are also miniature robotics if you guys want to check that out. So yeah. Do we have any questions? Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Let's come back together so we can do questions and, and, and uh, uh, questions and you can give us some answers. Awesome. I'm, I, I know I shouldn't come on voice, but this is so slick. I just have to say something. I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer. And um, I, besides all of my technical questions, I have a business idea for you. This past summer, I drove up into, I've become a photographer in my old age. I drive up into Lancaster County to the oldest Mennonite house that's there taking photographs. I look, it's surrounded by cornfields of the Amish and the Mennonite. I look up and here's a bird flying over the cornfield. And I say, no, that's not a bird. What the heck is that? So I run out there with my camera and it's a kite made to look like a hawk mm -hmm. because, because they have other expensive crops like flowers and fruits and vegetables and things. So, so they fly these hawk kites here and that looks just like your robo raven. Maybe you can't make a lot of money selling to the Amish, but uh, that's so slick. And th so this, uh, I have two quick questions. So this thing is uh, controlled by a controller in the person, in the hands of a person. Mm -hmm. So yep. it's not, it's not autonomous. Well, you said well, you were, you were, you were looking into just set it out there and get a program on there that'll lift it off and fly around and land again, which would be really slick. Yeah, there was one version that was semi-autonomous in the sense that, you know, it, it found a GPS point. And once we did that, it, it 
loitered around kind of like a, a bird circling uh yeah, and it did yeah. that by itself yeah well yeah. that would be perfect for the cornfield you could just set it up there and it would fly around there and scare away the crows and everything else there have been farmers that have come, uh, one, one vineyard owner in particular, who has uh, talked to some of the leading professors on the project and said, can we please use your platform? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, how, how long, uh, some of the harder questions, how long can it stay up in the, in so, the versions that you've seen? Yeah, that depends Wait, on the platform. Um, depends on how many milliampere hours mm -hmm. you have battery power on there. Yeah, Robo Raven one. Uh, I believe the it was about five minutes before the battery drained completely. Um, oh. Robo Raven five drains the battery much faster, but still is like you know four minutes or so. Um, I believe with the solar power we were able to extend it uh, a couple of minutes, so it's pretty yeah. We, we never really want to leave it up that long though, because after a certain point, uh, after, after, it, after the servo motors uh, um, go below five volts, they, they just drop out of the sky. And- uh, You kill a lot of robots that way. The, yeah. crash, the, the crashes are magnificent, let's just say. <laughs> that's good, I'm done, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. right, that's, that's, that's very seriously neat stuff. You are, you are a uh, you are a sharp person. Thank you. Thank you. And then I, I don't know if it was the same Richard who in the chat says that they've seen vision and robotic systems based on dragonfly brains, um, considering the amazing things they do with small number of neurons. And have you ever run across that? I have not run across that, but I have seen. Uh, the dragonfly itself being replicated, the, the flapping motion being replicated. I have seen that. Uh, Harvard um, has this, uh, cybo I think it's Cybotics or something like that lab, and they have done that. Um, but again, the biggest problem is that the, the energy density to get those, um, those things to flap back and forth. Uh, they, use it, they use a technology that um, when current goes through it, um, it bends, so you have to push a lot of current to get to get it to you know bend really quickly. So so the the they basically they're they're connected to a gigantic power system, and I think they finally got one uh, that lifted off by itself and and went down. Um, but yes, and there are people who are working on. So there's a whole there's a whole side of robotics called cognitive robotics, uh, which are robots that think and um, consider um, information. And, and so all of that is based on uh, neural pathways and how neural pathways think. And I, I know that they are not just looking at human neural pathways, but also um, animal neural pathways for that, for that stuff. Yeah. Um, also in the chat, we have Judy saying, hey. sorry, that's an eight-year-old. Um, we have Judy asking, what might be practical applications of this? And I guess we got one with the farmer. Yeah, there are quite a few applications um, for, I'm, I'm assuming for Robo Raven is the, the practical application. Uh, yeah, I, be I yeah. believe Judy was talking about Robo Raven, yeah. Okay, um, so besides the fact that they look like birds uh, and, and can um, possibly scare them away or not, uh, depending upon if they're an angry hawk that wants to eat them. Um, one of the other things that we looked at is the fact that the flapping behavior of birds can be used in some applications more advantageously than if it was a, you know, a fixed wing aircraft or a quad rotor. One of the biggest ones is if there's a chemical spill. So we were kind of inspired by it. I don't know if you guys remember, maybe five or six years ago, Houston had a really bad, there was a hurricane that came through. Houston had a really bad flood and there was a chemical spill that you know knocked out everything for a couple of, of days. Um, if you want to not involve humans, you, there's a whole engineering about you know keeping humans safe from dangerous situations. So if you want to not involve humans, then you're going to have to rely on robots. And uh, if you want to, you know, kind of zoom in and look at what's going on in this chemical spill, you know, to get a kind of bird's eye view and see, is it still spilling? Has it contained itself? Is there a fire? You know, um, 
if you use a fixed wing aircraft, UAV, you can kind of stay above it for a long period of time, but you can't really get very close as much. If you do, you're gonna have to, you know, climb back up again. And a lot of UAV pilots don't like to do the thing where you kind of come down and, you know, do like that. With a quad rotor, yes, you can, you know, set it down and pick it up. But those rotors, I tell you, they will kick up that stuff into the air. And especially if you have something like a fire where there's smoke, there may be, there's chemicals in the smoke, um, it can be dangerous. To, to put a quad rotor down there. So one of the things that we worked on besides the loitering behavior that I talked about before where you have a point in the air and the, the bird kind of flies around that point forever. And we put a little camera on there and, and showed that it was possible to see what was going on while the, the bird was flying around like that. Something else that we worked on was um, automatic diving. And basically what that is, is, you know, the bird flaps until it gets to a certain point. And then it has this angle of the wings, this dihedral angle, where it kind of just falls down pretty much. And then at a certain point before it hits the ground, it swoops back up. And what that does is it allows us to see, and again, camera on the UAV allowed us to see that it was possible to get a closer view of the ground that way. But because there aren't any propellers and because it has the capability of more moving the air rather than circulating it, it's a safer way of getting you know, information on the ground than another, a different conventional UAV. Um, and I believe that as we move forward with the platform, the applications are going to expand. I think that if we do start moving into the soaring um, capabilities where the platform is able to, you know, stay up for a very long period of time um, because it's using the atmosphere like a bird does. I think at that point we can start to see it um, surpass the capability of other UAVs and maybe be used in amazing uh, applications that other UAVs can't be used in. So. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so in the in the interdisciplinary teams or or or, or working on this, how uh, how are uh, are the biologists or the the, the uh, wildlife folks um, involved in in the process, or are they? And do you have to take do do are there is there a push then if you're in bioengine uh, bioinspired things to take that um, to take classes? In the, in the biological sciences, or do you rely on input from those, um, those experts? So at University of Maryland, there are, there's no requirement um, to take biological class, you know, classes on biology, although I did, because I just like it. Um, but I do believe that in other places, specifically Harvard, if you're going to do bioengineering, I believe they actually do kind of push you towards uh, at least a few bio, bio classes so that you understand what in the world you're doing. Um, but definitely we talk to the experts. It, it's really, I, I really do want to talk to biologists and such and, and just say, please give us more information, delve closer, like look, look closer, not just that the thing, but how it does what it does. We really want to know that. I know that there are some biologists that have kind of broken into the kinematic field uh, and I've started actually breaking down like how a bird moves its wings. What is the actual process for it? What does it look like in, in models? That is such critical information because that is exactly what we need to know in order to, to turn it into something physical. Um, in the medical sphere, I can tell you there is very close collaboration between doctors who understand the human body and people who are trying to replicate it, especially when you start moving towards surgical robotics or replicating the human hand or replicating neural connections. Um, so, yeah. Um, two questions with you. Um, one, what are you doing now? Hmm. And two is how did you always grow up with an affinity or nature, or did that, how did that come um, at, a, at a different point? Um, okay, so in answer to your first question, 
uh, just graduated in August. I um, had 12 years in school, so I took three months off, <laughs> basically. <laughs> there were some other things I wanted to do, <laughs> uh, but I actually am going to uh, teach bioinspired robotics um, for a semester at University of Maryland. And then I, I plan on, I, I really, really would like to get into oceanography. That's kind of where I, I definitely want to get into uh, exploring the deep and exploring coral reefs and exploring the Chesapeake Bay. That is, that is something that I desperately want to do. Uh, and archaeology, using robotics for archaeology, uh, like imaging uh, stuff. So that's kind of what I'm pushing towards. We'll see how that happens. Um, in answer to your second question, I have always loved nature. I can definitely tell you that from my earliest age, I've always loved nature. Now, I had no idea that you could, you know, engineer stuff to look like, I did not know that. I just liked dinosaurs uh, and I liked uh, the crocodile hunter. I would religiously watch the crocodile hunter uh, on TV. <laughs> I just loved uh, nature. So I, that's definitely grown over the years. I've definitely increased my uh, desire to, to stare at, you know, flora and fauna um, over the years, it, yeah. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Tracy says that anyone is a fan of bioinspired kinetic art sculpture. The artist Casey Curran has some mesmerizing work. So there, there's a link in there in the chat box about that um, as well. And Justine, I agree. This has been a fascinating presentation. Do we have any other questions right now um, for Dr. Johnson? Any questions? All right, I guess not, but you have definitely inspired us uh, to look at nature in a different way and to look at the uh, things that we use and uh, in the man-made world, uh, human-made world um, uh, in a different way as well. Uh, and hopefully we can all work together and and learn from nature. I love that they, nature does it better. <laughs> <laughs> and we're trying to catch up. So um, uh, again, thank you for all of that, that, the work that you've put into this and um, that you continue to do. We're gonna follow your exploits and we'd love for you to come visit us at our museum because we have all kinds of fossils and uh, bones and everything that you can think of that tells the 4.6 billion year story of this place that we call Maryland. So please come and visit us. Um, and we have an archaeology club as well. So maybe you can listen to that that talk on the, the buttons that were made from the uh, from from the shells of that. Uh... All right. Well, thank, thank you, you all. Me. Thank you all for coming and spending some time with us and getting smarter. Um, hope to see you at one of our next presentations that are coming up. Remember that there are some spaces left in the history of pollination class that's being taught uh, by Dr. Jody Johnson. So I do hope um, to see you there. And we have field trips that are coming online. They, they, they get filled up quick. So. Make sure that you are tuned in and connected on all the social media uh, links and platforms so that you can get in and stay curious and stay outside. Um, everybody take care and stay well. Good night.